Hey everybody, and welcome to week four. Um, this, as you are probably aware, is your last week of actual content. And uh, the material that we're gonna be looking at this week is incredibly significant because I think it's safe to say that of all historical events that the United States has been a part of, the Civil War is perhaps the most climactic as far as the United States itself specifically is concerned and the impact uh, that a event had upon the United States. And so um, all of the material for this week is gonna focus in on that one particular event. And so we're gonna be focusing first and foremost on the causes of the war, then on the war itself, and then briefly on the post-war period known as Reconstruction. Now, one of the things that I try and teach against is a historical binary. So when we think about the causes of the Civil War, the binary that gets created is that the war was caused because of slavery. And the uh, war was fought by Northerners who wanted to abolish slavery against Southerners who wanted to keep that institution alive. The truth of the matter is, is that any historical event is going to start and be caused by far more than just one cause. And the Civil War is no exception. Slavery definitely is a key and fundamental cause for the war, but it is by no means the only thing that caused the war to happen. So for example, Abraham Lincoln, when the war eventually begins uh, in April, April 12th, 1861, um, he uh, is gonna go to war in order to preserve the Union. He says, I have no desire to free the slaves. He says in his first inaugural address after being elected, that he has no inclination to free the slaves, and he doesn't think he has any political authority to free the slaves. Indeed, many radical Republicans in the Republican Party believe that Lincoln's position on slavery is too lenient. You see, radical Republicans wanted to abolish slavery, generally speaking. Abraham Lincoln wanted to keep slavery from spreading into the new territories. He was okay to allow slavery to um, exist where it already did, but he didn't want to see it spread. This is known as an anti-slavery individual. And please understand that many folks in the North, one, were not abolitionists, two, were anti-slavery people, but you may well want to restrict the spread of slavery for reasons other than you see slavery as being a moral problem. So for example, there were a group of folks who developed in the 1850s known as the Free Soilers. And Free Soilers were individuals who did not want to see slavery move into the new Western territories through manifest destiny, we're acquiring more land, right? Free Soilers, anti-slavery folks, don't want to see slavery expand into the West because they do not want to deal with slavery economically. So for example, Abraham Lincoln's father, Thomas uh, uh, Lincoln, uh, was unable to um, be successful as a farmer in Kentucky because of the establishment of slavery. So he was forced to leave. And so Lincoln's position about slavery has as much to do with his um, kind of developmental belief that it's a moral wrong. I think by the time he's assassinated, I think he does come to that conclusion. But initially, Lincoln opposes slavery on economic grounds, right? Poor white Westerners who are farmers can't compete with the institution of slavery. It will put them out of business, and so they simply do not want to see it expand. And so slavery is a cause for the war, but it's not the only cause. And you're going to see this. We have a video this week that's going to cover, briefly, four main causes for the war. I've also provided for you an online interactive activity that will also cover four main causes of the war. And roughly speaking, we might take a look and say that there are many causes for the Civil War, but for the want of time, we're only gonna look at four. Slavery is one of them. But you also have issues over states' rights. You also have issues over economic differences. As we saw last week, uh, the North became industrialized while the South remained agricultural, okay? And one wonders, can those two different economies coexist forever? And then the final one, and we know Abraham Lincoln goes to war for this, is the preservation of the Union, okay? Um, and so with these four major causes, you're going to see throughout the 1850s a number of what I call trigger events, okay? Historical events or happenings 
that occur, which create conflict. So we're going to be talking about some of these. Uh, you'll read about them through your textbook and there's a video, but there's a number of these trigger events and they, you could see them beginning in the 1820s with the Missouri Compromise. And the Missouri Compromise demonstrates that manifest destiny, westward expansion is a cause for the war. It demonstrates that slavery is a cause for the war. But more specifically, it demonstrates that the westward expansion of slavery is the cause of the war or a cause of the war. You're gonna see in the nullification crisis, which you saw under Andrew Jackson's administration, that also created tension, so much so that South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union over protective tariffs, specifically the tariff of abominations, also known as the tariff of 1828, right? This is a state's rights issue. And the state's rights argument is an interesting one because it really forces you to have to try to divorce slavery from their argument. And the argument is this, is that, yeah, slavery is a right that the Southerners are concerned that they are going to lose. But the bigger issue for Southerners is the power of the federal government to be able to dictate what the South could do. One of the things that they're worried about is slavery, but there are other things as well. Okay, lots of different trigger events. We're gonna see the Wilmot Proviso. We're gonna talk about the Kansas-Nebraska Act. In fact, the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, is a, a, a central component to one of your questions this week. Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was initially created by Stephen Douglas out of Illinois, uh, and he wanted to build a transcontinental railroad and he wanted to um, build the railroad uh, with a terminus in Chicago because he owned property there. And if you build a railroad in Chicago, or at least the terminus there, your, your property value is going to increase. But he wanted to build the railroad through what would eventually become the Kansas and Nebraska area. So what he has to do is he has to organize the Nebraska territory and he um, breaks it up into two, Nebraska and Kansas. Now, both of these regions lie north of the Missouri Compromise 3630 parallel line, which means that according to the Missouri Compromise, uh, these new territories would not be open to slavery. Well, Stephen Douglas isn't going to get the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed through Southern legislatures unless he gives them something. And so rather than abide by the Missouri Compromise, which many people in the North thought that he should have done, but instead of abide by that, he introduces this concept known as popular sovereignty. Uh, you saw this in the Compromise of 1850, which is another trigger event. It's going to be another cause for the war. Um, that's, uh, that's an event where California gets admitted into the Union, but there's popular sovereignty uh, introduced uh, in that document as well. But basically, the idea of popular sovereignty is that the people can choose for themselves whether or not slavery will exist or not exist there. And as you will see throughout your course of study this week, um, violence is going to erupt in Kansas. Uh, so much so that the region becomes known as Bleeding Kansas. You've got a number of violent attacks, uh, particularly I can think of the sack upon Lawrence, which will inevitably lead to another attack at Pottawatomie Creek at the hands of John Brown, where he uh, is uh, basically trying to have retribution against the sack of Lawrence. So he murders a bunch of pro-slavery people and hacks them to death with broadswords in front of their families, and it just becomes a mess. You've got a number of other events as well. Uh, you would have the Dred Scott case, You've got the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and then ultimately Abraham Lincoln's own election in 1860 uh, contributes to uh, the coming of the war. Now, Lincoln, again, made it very clear that he had no intention of freeing the slaves where they already existed. Please understand this. Lincoln is not the great emancipator. Even once he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, even once that's issued, he's doing it out of military necessity. He's not doing it because he necessarily has this moral indignation. In fact, um, when the war initially began in 1861, a gentleman by the name of John C. Fremont, uh, who was very central to California, um, he is in the military and he issues an Emancipation Proclamation and Lincoln says, no, 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 we're not freeing the slaves. And the reason why he does that is because there are border states like Kentucky and Tennessee. And by this point, Virginia, who has not yet seceded, they will, right? But you have some of these border states who have slaves and Lincoln doesn't want to do anything that might push them out of the Union. So when John C. Fremont frees the slaves, he says, no, we're not doing that. And in fact, when Lincoln finally does free the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which goes into effect January 1st, 1863, um, he's doing this for a number of military reasons, Why? Right? One, if you make the war about slavery, foreign alliances like the British and the French are not going to ally with the South. And there had been some discussions of that happening. And Abraham Lincoln knew those nations, they didn't have slavery and they weren't going to support a country that did. 
right? And they weren't going to support a country that was fighting in order to protect slavery, so let's make the war about slavery, right? It's a military strategy. Don't let them get foreign alliances, right? It's also a strategy in the sense that um, if you free all the slaves from the South, you could bake, break the backs of the Southern economy because who's holding up the Southern economy? Slaves. So it's strategic to break the backs of the Southern economy, break the back of the Southern economy. And as we will also see, there is a move on behalf of the United States to uh, organize all black units. The 54th Massachusetts comes to mind, for example, organized in 1863. And so you now add troops to your numbers. Um, and it's also interesting to note when Lincoln initially issued the Emancipation, which was in September of 1862, but it doesn't go effect until 1863. And if you look at the language of the Emancipation, you will see that it only freed the slaves in states that were in active rebellion. It does not free the slaves in the Union, and there were slaves still in the Union. It does not free slaves in Confederate territories that were controlled by the Union. It only frees the slaves in states that are in active rebellion against the United States. Why issue it two months before it goes into advance, before it goes into place? Because what Lincoln is saying is, if you come back into the Union on January 1st, 1863, if you come back in and stop fighting, then you get to keep your slaves. So understand, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. It definitely changed the direction of the war, evidenced by Gettysburg Address, 1863, following the Battle of Gettysburg, which took place from July 1st to July 3rd of uh, 1863, perhaps the most famous of all Civil War battles. Um, where Lincoln, of course, at the Gettysburg Address says this war is about a new birth of freedom, right? And in the end, of course, we get the 13th Amendment. It is a Reconstruction Amendment, one of three, that gets passed, and it ends slavery. And so all of these things got, you know, we need to think about them when we start talking about what caused the war. Now, of course, the war will begin, and the main event or the one event that really sort of sparked the war is the attack upon Fort Sumter that occurs on April 12, 1861. Uh, and then we have a four-year-long war. Uh, and there are a number of important battles uh, that you might want to be aware of. You definitely want to be aware of some of the strategies that the United States uh, undertook. Um, you know, the Anaconda Plan, for example, uh, um, which was adopted uh, after the first battle of Bull Run, which is in fact also the very first battle of the war. Um, that plan is initially adopted until eventually at the very, very end of the war under Ulysses S. Grant, we begin a policy of attrition. And the reason why a policy of attrition is so important is because the South simply doesn't have the resources that the North has. In fact, it's one of its weaknesses. One of the, one of the, the advantages that the North has is they've got all the railroads. They've got all the main manufacturing. They're able to produce guns and grow enough food. I mean, by the end of the Civil War, the, the South is running out of supplies, right? The reason why the Battle of Gettysburg even happens is because the South is moving north. Lee has a strategic reason for doing this, but they move north in search of, of, of shoes. And the two armies bump into one another as they're searching for shoes because, you know, they couldn't find a Payless or an Adidas or a Nike store somewhere. So they're looking for shoes and the war breaks out, okay? Now, for the most part, Despite the fact that the North had many more advantages with respect to population, towards manufacturing, they did have some weaknesses in the sense that their military just was not as up to speed as the Southerners were. And in fact, from 1861 until early 1863, the South really proves the better of the two armies. By 1863, however, the World War is going to begin to shift. And there are three battles that you need to be aware of. One is the Battle of Gettysburg. One is the Battle of Vicksburg, and the Battle of Vicksburg is significant because it gave the Union control over the Mississippi River. In fact, the Union takes possession of a stretch of the Mississippi River from Port Hudson to Vicksburg. And the reason why that's important is because whoever controlled that stretch of the Mississippi could control what goods flowed between the, uh, between the two halves of the South. And the reality is, is that Texas beef and Louisiana sugar funneled through that portion of the Mississippi River to feed the main thrust of Lee's armies. After 1863, the Union is going to control the Mississippi, and they will be able to literally cut off the supplies to the South. Eventually, by 1864-65, a new strategy is put into place with the, the, the one with, uh, with attrition. Grant is going to specifically go after Lee's army and fight him in a way that 
he had never been really accustomed to. Most of the Union generals up, uh, up to uh, 1864, they either didn't take advantage of a situation, they didn't execute their, their, uh, their maneuvers soon enough, or they allowed Lee to retreat. Grant doesn't do that. And he just pursues Grant, or Grant pursues Lee, pursues Lee, pursues Lee, until eventually the war will end at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, 1865, when uh, Grant gives Lee very generous terms. He basically says, you'll sign a parole, put your guns down, go home, right? Uh, and that's an amazing amount of leniency, okay? At the same time that Grant is chasing Lee down between 64 and 65, you're also going to see Sherman uh, engage on what is known as his infamous, infamous march to the sea, where he basically turns the South into firewood. He just lights it up uh, and begins to attack civilian populations because uh, the Union by 1864 recognized that there was a connection between the South's ability to fight and its morale. And if you still had a fighting spirit from among the civilian population, the war continue on. Okay. In the end, the Union wins. And now following the war, we get Reconstruction. And this is a process that really gets going uh, from 1865 to 1877. There are three main phases of Reconstruction. You've got wartime Reconstruction, presidential Reconstruction, and presidential Reconstruction is going to be um, uh, basically a, a somewhat short period of time in 1865 from about uh, the time that Abraham Lincoln is assassinated and he is killed uh, April 14th, April 15th, he dies, he's shot on April 14th, 1865. And Andrew Johnson, who um, had been uh, Lincoln's running mate in the uh, election of 1864, will become president. Uh, and he basically restores the Union to the way that it was. And the problem is, is under presidential reconstruction, what Johnson accomplished was to basically restore the Union the way it was. And if you simply restore the Union to the way it was, you didn't really change anything. And so following presidential reconstruction, you get what's called wartime, uh, or, um, not wartime, um, congressional reconstruction or radical reconstruction. And it's during radical reconstruction that the radical Republicans in Congress really begin to forward a bunch of civil rights legislation, specifically the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, 13th, which ends slavery. 14th gives um, basically due process, basically makes the Bill of Rights, which applied to the, the federal government, and now it's going to apply to the state governments. And then the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed uh, voting rights to men. Sorry, ladies, not yet. That's coming, but not yet. Um, in the end, Reconstruction is a bit of a failure because um, although African Americans in the South gained some rights, and although the 13th, 14th Amendments were passed, after Reconstruction ends in 1877, Jim Crow legislation is passed, which basically segregates African Americans. Um, although they are not slaves, most African Americans become sharecroppers, uh, and they basically work the same land that they had been working on for most of their lives. And, the, you know, the lives of African Americans in the South does not get remarkably better economically and socially after 1877 um, when Reconstruction ends. And so in many ways, uh, it, it, it's kind of a failure. But that's what we're going to be looking at this week. Obviously, I could go on and on and on, but you've got other resources that you can look at. But if you have questions, contact me. I'm passionate about this particular topic. I love the Civil War. I love to study it. Uh, so if you have questions, let me know, and I'll get back to you. Otherwise, as always, go in peace, be warm and filled. May the force be with you, live long and prosper, and may the odds forever be in your favor. Have a blessed week, guys.